All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and uh, you want to turn to page seven in your manual. We're going to start on page seven in our manual on lesson number two. So turn to page seven. Right. Now, I want all of you guys now to close your eyes for a minute. Everybody close their eyes. And now, if I say, picture the word church. What comes into your mind as you're thinking of picturing what a church looks like? And what's your picture of your church that you're imaging right now? Probably has not a lot to do with what scripture says, but most of that image you have in church has to do with your culture, your tradition, your family, the city that you grew up with, your image that you have of the church. It's probably completely different than someone in Sudan, Africa, or someone in Syria or something. Your image of church is really based more on your culture, your religion, your upbringing, what you know, than it is in Scripture. You can open your eyes now, unless you want to eat. I don't know you're not sleeping. Uh, I deliver this, give it that exercise. Uh, for the time. Because um, really, if you look at scripture, it wasn't a building like this. Which is nothing to care about because nothing wrong. It wasn't built like this. Because if one, if you're being persecuted for being a Christian, you're not going to build a big building up announcing everybody there's a bunch of Christians in here because you're going to be taken out. And you wouldn't put a cross up on there because the cross was the instrument known for the most hideous way of killing someone in an event. And it was an uh, example of a Roman rule, Roman territory, let me see, this is just Roman rule, let's put it that way. And, and so it's almost like if I put a, if I put a hang noose up on top of my building, it ain't gonna win it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, because it, it would detract people instead of attracting people. So our image of what we have in our of church and understanding of most of it has come from what you remember when you were growing up, what your parents were growing up, what your culture, whether you're in the United States or you're in China or you're Christian, has, um, has placed it. If we look at on page 7, I put it up right here on the board. Church is revolved around about four things. The center of church and why we're Christian, why we're here is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I do a crown. I think our thing says Jesus is King. Same thing, Jesus is King, Jesus is Lord. The Lordship is at the center of all this, of all that we do. And this is a loaded statement right here. You can say Jesus emphasized that it is Lord, or you can put Jesus is to emphasize the Lord. If you emphasize Jesus is Lord and emphasize the Lord, that is exercising the Lordship, that it is monotheism, that it is was one true God, it is Jesus, it is who we surrender to, it is who we turn our life over to, it is whoever this person is, is our Lordship who we complete this church. If you emphasize this part, that Jesus is Lord, then Jesus defines what that Lordship looks like. If I was to say that he is Lord, that's a good thing. That is a sweet lady. She loved Jesus and everything. If I was to say Hitler is Lord, it puts a total different, different feeling in your heart. So we have to, to know Jesus, the, the Lordship of Jesus is mine with the Lord. But who he is, at his essence, Jesus, this defines the Lordship, who we're supposed to imitate, who we're supposed to follow. So Jesus is Lord, and understanding Jesus and his Lordship is at the center of all that we do in the church. And then there's three things God tells us to do. Love God as a church. We're supposed to love our neighbor as a church. And we're supposed to make disciples together. Loving God. We love God through prayer, through worship, what we do here, through reading the scriptures. Through that, we well, the most, the church is supposed to love God. Our church is supposed to love our neighbors. We're supposed to do that by inviting them to come and participate, by 
House the harvest by serving people, by greeting people, by seeking out the lost, those who do not know Jesus. Look, as a church, we're called to love our neighbors, give it Jesus. We're called to make disciples. We're called to be in accountability with each other. To, um, when you see someone doing something great with the spirit, to encourage them. If you see something that's leading to the detriment, try to discourage them. We're here to try to walk together, imitate each other, to try to make us more, to imitate this person right here, Jesus, individually and as collectively as a group. And this is what the core of church is. You know, here we're baptizing, making disciples is where we baptize. We baptize people when we make disciples in here. You know, uh, loving God, loving neighbor is when we do the Lord's Supper. We're saying we love God. You know, we love our neighbors because we're doing it together. All this entails church. And then, if you look, think about the rest of church in our thing, in our church, we've added, we've added buildings, we've added programs, we've added budget, we've added staff. Now, first of all, none of these things are bad. They're all good. But they're all, I say, tools. A building is great. I mean, a building can come in, you can gather, it can be a place where you do trainings, where you can worship, where you send people out. It can also be a place that you huddle and cuddle, it can be a crack house, it can be something that's not good. You know, budget is good. Money is good. Money can buy a pound of food for the homeless, it can buy a pound of cocaine and destroy people. So money is a tool too. Staff is not, there's nothing here to evil with staff. Even staff helps go with stuff that have staff can sometimes control. And programs, programs are something good, but if it comes all about what we can do for me, what I have, what does the church have to offer me, all about the trying to then programs can take over. And so none of this, these that we've added. And this is all that we need for church. None of it that we added is wrong. The thing is, is that most of the time, this is what takes over. I know so many pastors not then that all they're doing is dealing with budgets and trustees and building and stuff. What kind of programs are you doing for the kids, for our youth, for our girl, our adults? Look at our budget. We're in debt. We need money. We need this. Look at staff. I got deal. We need a youth pastor, worship leader. You know, we're doing this. And you spend your whole time doing this. And not so much as this. And I, I made a couple pastors weekly, and they just say that 90% of their time is dealing with this. And they never really get to spend time loving God. They wish they could hang out at the Waffle House and make disciples. They'd love to be doing this, but this is what has consumed them. This is what has consumed the church. And this, these right here on the outside, even so they're all good in the tools, can take us away from what is what we're called to be loving God, loving neighbors, and making disciples. And for so like I said, so this, nothing is inherently wrong, but this can end up taking over, being the priority, being what motivates people, being what God, instead of Jesus is Lord. And I have in there the like majors versus cathedrals. This is a major. When you came, when the, when the wise men, when the shepherds, when they came to the manger to see Jesus, the only reason they came is because they love Jesus. Because they heard from angels, they heard someone told me that Jesus is there, that they loved him enough, that they traveled because they wanted to be around people. It wasn't about just, wasn't trying to find a a, a, a contact for a job. It wasn't anything else. It was simply because they love Jesus. And one of the, what I find personally, one of the most struggles is, is as you build a building, as you make a cathedral, it's more about these other things that attract. And I know churches that are growing and they're wrestling with this. How do you keep a manger's heart when you've got 200,000, 500,000 people. How do you try to keep a major's heart 
when this is being the focus. When me and Nancy were in Lexington, we were part of a church named Carbon Bricks. And we worked on discipleship. We prayed over it. You know, we had all this, this. We met for a year in the houses. And we were really about discipleship. And, and wanted to have a church that had this at the center. And we finally rented a movie theater in downtown Lexington. And we launched. And when we launched that Sunday, we had a hundred and something people show. And this one was gone. It's like, and all of a sudden, okay, how are we going to get these people in? What are the programs? What are, we need parking attendants. We, we need staff. How are we going to get this? And what was in our heart all this time in discipleship went out the window, and we were like, manage people, manage parking, and then we went into this right here. And everything that we did for a year was, I would say it was gone, but this wasn't what we were about. And so it's, it's not that, but it's just that thing that how do you grow? And you've got to be really careful and intentional about this. And you know, a couple of churches do it. How do you go from a manger to a cathedral or a bit big? And keep this at your heart. And keep this at your center. This is your motive of why you would do it. And you need to be really, really intentional about this. And I struggle with this all the time. And I know other pastors you know, do. And I know we do. We need to keep this at a center. Like this building. And our church building will bless, but it's a resource, it's a tool that's supposed to lead people to love God, love your neighbor, making disciples, not the end to, you know, the such programs, budget, all this. And so the more you add to something, and also, our goal, as we said yesterday, is multiplication. I can multiply this pretty easily. Having eight, ten people in a house church, 12, I said, you know, Calvin, I want you to start, let's pray about starting a house church. Patrick's pay for side of the house church. Ryan, Mike, side of the house church. You can multiply 10 in the house and, and multiply and reach people, reach people. Multiplying this is difficult. Because not everybody's got $500,000 million to start building. You don't have worship leaders instead. You don't have programs. You don't have much. This is really, really hard to multiply. So once you start moving into this, it just slows down multiplication, slows down growth because. This is really, really hard to do. And it's really, really expensive to do. It's the, so the best. Anybody, anybody, anybody can leave, and I would say that, clarify, anybody can leave 10, 12 people. You know, we're trying to lead, come to church, lead 200 people, the worship, the band, the program, and everything, and that narrows, 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 and narrows it down. And I know most churches I've been to, the more it grows, the more narrow those are, because you might be okay to have someone come up and leave and you've got 20 people. Man, once you get to 200, man, we need a better seat. we got to do more with five. Once you get to 2,000, when you do your interviews, you better make sure that they got a degree in music. They can sing the next up because everything elevates so much that you just, the, the pool that you can get shrink to lead that. You know, once you get a uh, children's ministry that's got 300 kids, your, your application form is going to be a lot, lot more narrow than it is if you've got six kids in your, in your Sunday school. You, you understand that? But the more you concentrate on this, the more it actually takes away the opportunities for everyone to serve and everybody to be a minister and it concentrates into a very, very select key. So we as Tony for all this, we need to concentrate on or uh, whatever church or holy seat you're at. It's keeping Jesus as Lord at the center and not getting caught up even though the children, this becomes the priority where you spend 99% of your time. Because I know most of our churches that I've been to, you know, that 90% of the resources, 90% of what they do is for one hour on Sunday. It's for all do X2 the praise, the worship, the staff, everything. That one hour Sunday is what everything's directed to. You play that one hour Sunday, and there's really not much of everything is directed toward that. And there's nothing wrong with that one hour Sunday. But it needs to be something more than that. And I have down there the status, the satisfaction, the status quo. How if you're calling this one reason the way that makes you change is you gotta have a knowledge of a better way, the knowledge of a first step, and that has to be stronger than the inertia of the church 
where you are headed. Meaning, most churches, there's a bell curve, you know, and you got the life of the church, and you know, here you're growing, and here you're, you know, whatever it says, you're, you're, doing, you're doing great. It's not till, you know, you have 200 people, 40, down to 30, that you think, oh my gosh, we got to do something wrong. We got to do something different. We're not doing something right. Instead of doing it up here, continuing, most churches, they get to a place where they're declining, that the numbers are down, they're falling before they think, you know, we need to do something different. And a lot of this is, is most things that top people from being great keep you know, it's because you're doing something good. I don't know how many have read that book, Good to Great. I would highly recommend it. It's you're doing something good, so you're satisfied doing with the good things. And you might be doing 10 good things, but really if you did one or two great things, it would take you off. And you got to realize what good things that I'm doing that we need to let go of so we can do something great. And that's what knowledge of a better way. You have to have that knowledge of a better way. I talked to some pastors who are uh, churches in Woodcott, and, and I said, you know, why don't you change it? If you don't know, if you don't know there's a different way, if you don't know another way of doing it, it doesn't matter what you have to decide how much they love Jesus, how much they really want their church to grow, how much that they do, if you do not know that next step in a different way, you're not going to do it. So it's got to be knowledge of a better way, knowledge of the first step, how to do it, has to be greater than nursery church. If all the church say we're doing fine, we're doing fine. If someone says I want to do something new, no, we're doing fine. We don't have to do that. No, we're doing okay. We don't have to do that. You know, and usually they get said to you, man, we're not fine. We need to do something different. Then please stop changing. If you can do it while you're healthy and while you're more healthy, it's going to change everything. So I'm going to look at a model of a simple church. And it's on page 41 in your appendix. Um, let's go to page 40. 42 has a brief outline. That's kind of the clearest outline of it. It starts on page 41, but it goes to 42. And when I say, it's called house churches. And it's basically just this simple church. I know plenty of people who just don't do it in the house. Danny leads one in the flea market. There's something they saw in the restaurant. So it's you know, micro churches, whatever you want to call it, is just looking at scripture of what the, that church was. He says, Paul with the church of Antioch, it wasn't a church like this, it was all the little churches that was gathered. This wasn't. And so there's three aspects of all simple churches in that that are there. Says, one is looking back, two is looking up, and three is looking forward. Looking back is looking back, accountability, looking back at people's life, their week, how was it, what you need to pray for, how did you do? Looking up is your relationship with God, that's word, prayer, and then looking forward is, all right, I received this from God, who do I need to share? And most, most groups, you know, the dog depends can last an hour and a half, two hours. And I'm going to jump in at the looking at the middle part because it kind of flows a little better. The, the look at the looking, um, looking up. When you go to, to, when you, if you come, to the simple church design is that when you first get there, you do looking back. And then you go to looking up. The looking up is basically simple Bible. It's homiletics in the group. You're going to get in a group of people, and you're going to read. Like right now, my Bible study as a church, we are going through <coughs> the New Testament. So when we get to my our, our church on Wednesdays, we just we use those readings. Everybody's been reading it, and so whatever that reading is for that day is what we're looking at those chapters. And we just ask people simple questions. What do you like about <coughs> What do you find difficult? What don't you like about it? Because anybody, it doesn't matter if you've read the Bible before for 10 years, but you're new to it, you can read something and say, you know what, I like this about what it says. And you can say, I don't like this what the Bible says. It opens up to anybody. And then we always ask ourselves, what is this teaching us about God, Jesus? Because we can get away from walking away from today. We want to have a better understanding of who God is. And then we say, well, what does this teach us about people? You know, because the whole point is, I'm going to be able to witness and minister to people, so what does this teach us about people? And then when we're done, 
we'll go around and we'll have a time of prayer and we'll ask you to break down to the Holy Spirit what he's revealed to you. From this time of scripture, what has he personally shared you? What did you learn from Say it's on finances. We're talking about it. So say you're talking about Ephesians or in your family. It's about your spouses and your wife. You would say whatever you learned about that spouse. So you, everybody write down and share what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit's going to speak to everything. And then next you write down, who do I need to share this? You know, we have a looking up. We get this, receive something from God. Our, goal, our thing is not to hold it. Your understanding that Jesus is Lord, your understanding what you got, does not affect anybody around you unless you share it. And so who do I need to share? To say it was on, like so studying about uh people about marriage and, and wife, things about action. And so say I knew he's a person that made in the gym who's I saw him at the gym be abusive with his wife. So I said, no, I want to go talk to him that your, that your wife's supposed to be with right. So I'll put that I need to share this with him. And then also then write down, who do you need to share your testimony? Who do you need to share the gospel? We'll go around and we'll share it. This is why I started here. We come back next week. It's a looking back, number one. So when you come back that week, you know, just think you did now, prayer request, how your week was. But then you go back, okay, and go, all right, Gary, you uh, said last week that you were going to share this with Bill. You're going to share with Bill at the gym about your life. Did you share? And I might say, uh, I don't know. Uh, that happens now and then, but it's usually you don't forget. Or I might say, you know, I was at the gym, but Bill wasn't there. He usually comes on Tuesday, he wasn't there, so I did not have the opportunity to share with Bill, so I didn't share. With but then if I say I was there, Bill was there, but I didn't share, then that becomes obedience. Then that becomes, when we talk to get careful, then that is when you need encouragement from each other. Okay, Bill was there, you were there. You just pray the Holy Spirit, why didn't you share? Because that is one thing that we all need is encouraging in our walk in a loving way so we can share. And then by encouragement, if you look at most, most of these houses, churches, or most things, that encouraging, that looking back is the first thing that does. Because people don't like that. We don't like that company. We don't like having to share. We don't like being accountable. And then it ends up, which is nothing wrong, it ends up being a Bible study. Which means we're going to go through the book of John. So you get there one day, that Sunday, okay, we'll go through John 1. You study John 1, you get to know it. All right, guys, see you next week. Next week you get together, okay, we're going to do John 2. You study John 2, and you go through John 2. Next week you get we do John 3. That's all fine, but there is no one. There is no sharing. There is no who do I need to share this with? Who do I need to do? And it just becomes a boss. So the accountability of right? looking back and looking forward is a part that makes us the most uncomfortable. But it is the most critical part to that because without that, we're not going to share. We're not going to share. So there's all the aspects of it. You got looking back when we pray with each other every week. Accountability. You got that looking up part. Where we receive from God and share with God's word. What's great about that is when you're doing it with eight to ten people, and no one's looking at the commentaries in the Bible. No one's looking, it's just sharing. I'll get to hear what it says to what to Randy, what it says to Kyle, what it says to Calvin. And it's like you can see a different side of the of a dime, a different reflection. I get all these different inputs that I'll never get on my own. And then when you leave that house, it's not you're not critiquing a sermon. Because you all participated, you all made that message, you all walked away. It's just a really cool thing. And then everybody knows when they're leaving there, you've got someone intentionally in mind who you're going to share with. And who you're going to share testimony. And, and then it just comes out really good. So that's kind of the basic problem in the house church and this gathering. It's all of us are called to love each other, love our neighbor. Right? I'm supposed to be the beginning, the beginning. How was your week? Prayer requests. Love them enough to tell them. Love God. And we're looking up how, what is God telling us to do? And then make disciples. Who am I going to share this with? Or who am I going to walk this with? Is what that is all about. And if you flip back to page nine now on your on your page.
It's called Wall, which is model assist wall shape. This square right here, this is Jesus' ministry on earth. If you look at Jesus' ministry on earth, the first thing was Jesus did. This is Jesus did you help? This is you do. You do. Jesus helps. And this is you do. And then you do. Jesus watches. This is what all throughout Acts, all throughout Jesus' gospel, this is what he did. When he gave something, Jesus did it. They watch. I put they watch. Healing the, uh, this would be casting out of demons. Healing the sick. Healing the blind. Jesus did it. They watched. Then they got the coffee. Jesus did. You help. Feeding the 5,000. I'm going to go put your hand out the bread. You help participate in it. In some way, that he got him to help. You knew Jesus helps. He sent out in the seven passages, Matthew 10, Luke 10. I'm going to send you guys out. You go do the lesson. You go out and come back. And then this critique it. And then this is kind of where I'm at. Jesus leaves. We have this Holy Spirit. We do. Jesus watches. He comes. This is my, this is discipleship. This is how we do everything that we do. When they get to learn a bike, you, you, you learn to ride a bike by watching someone do it. They're watching you ride a bike, right? When you come over here, they ride the bike, but you're on training wheels, you're running with them, you're helping them, they do it. You do, he helps them know why they're riding it, put limits on, don't go behind, past this street and this street, remember the rules, remember to stop. And then finally, when they got it, boom, see, it could be back at 10 o'clock, and they're doing it, they're riding the bike. We understand that. But on most top churches, services that I know, it goes from Jesus did, to they do, and you skip the most important part. You do, I do, you help. You do, I do, I do you want, uh, Jesus, I do, you help, I do, you watch. You come in on a Sunday morning, and you watch a pastor who spent a whole week and hours performing, perfecting a message. You got worship beds up there who practice two or three times to get things done. You got staff, everyone, all these guys are professionals. They give you a message, you sit there, observe. There is no help to you share your testimony. There's no help to you share the gospel. There's no, and then boom, Monday morning, you're not. And you're in your office. And you're supposed to share your testimony. You're supposed to share the gospel. You're supposed to love your neighbor. And you've never practiced. You've never had a problem. You never got to stuff. And so we don't do it. And the pastors are wondering why, why we're not making disciples. Why are we not helping people? Why not? Because we skip these two parts. And that's one thing that we need to get back in is that modeling, because we understand it. We understand that if some of the doctors in the class and he's taking a class on surgery, he's not going to go straight from there to surgery. He's going to have an internship. He's going to mentor. He's going to have a process of learning stuff before he's going to operate on somebody. We're not going to want someone who's going to operate on us who just sat in class. We're going to want him to have an actual hands on experience. And so that's kind of how we, uh, in the church, we need to get to back to that place where we are bodily and mentoring and walking along inside it. And I can't do that to 200 people, 50 people, 40 people. But each one of you guys can give us a few do with each other. Because it takes time, it takes intimacy, it, it takes, it, it, it takes, many things it takes accessibility. And we don't have a lot of time accessibility. For me to model Nancy, for me to do something, I gotta write her to my life. I gotta write her into my home. I gotta write her to some place where she can model and actually give up part of my time to do that. And Nancy or whoever else has to give up part of their time. And I can't do that for 50 people. You know, none of you can, but each one of us, we can we can if we get into smaller groups, we can do that with each other walk. Just at your table right now. This is doing our way. We share more intimately in a way prayer requests and stuff that you're able to do in a group of 50 people for 75 people. 
So we are going to practice doing a simple church. And like I said, that model is on page 42. We're going to practice that at your table right now. We're going to practice looking back, looking back at your week and now I know normally you would have read the scripture. We know on Wednesdays that we are going to be going through Acts. I know that. When we get together in my house next Wednesday, we're going to be looking at those chapters of Acts. So you have, um, I mean, for the looking up of like, your Acts. We're also going to know that looking back, you know, you're going to have those prayer uh, who are supposed to, who I'm supposed to share with. So they're going to ask that you share them. You guys have it. You guys last week didn't say you were going to share something with someone, so you don't have it coming. So I want you for your accountability by looking back, by look at your homework for last week. So for the accountability part, for looking back from the beginning, look at your homework for last week again. Look at the ways that you were accountable in that. And then for the looking up part, I want to use Matthew 10. Uh, this was Matthew 10.